Emerindar was a dwarven kingdom based beneath and around the Great Peak Mountains. It was not a powerful realm, however it did stand for over 5,000 years. The Emerindaran dwarves fought with drow and beholders. They mined, smithed, and traded substantial quantities of adamantine. These dwarves were active outside their realm. Several of their tunnels and underground projects still stand beneath the high forest in the northwest of Faerun. They even founded their own arcane academy. So please come delve into the history and environs of the kingdom of Imarindar. Unlike previous episodes, I'm showing images on the YouTube version, though I've made a point to ensure the images are not needed to enjoy and understand the material if you are strictly listening to the audio version. Borders of Amarindar Amarindar predominantly occupied the central region of the Grey Peak Mountains, but compared to other dwarven realms of old, Amarindar's borders were less rigidly defined. Scholars have placed the borders loosely around the following locations. The western border ran along the tree line of the high forest till it reached a crag called Dahal Rock, just upriver from Loudwater, on the Delimber River, which is also called the River Shining. Traveling east, the border is believed to have followed the road in between Loudwater and Lork till it reached the South Wood. The border then turns southwards to account for the Great Peak Mountain Range. Bleached Bones Pass, known in Dwarven as Naurogroth, is the southernmost tip of Emerindar's border. The border then continues eastward to Decanter. The eastern border shoots to the top of the High Gap, which is known in Dwarven as Horinden Lar. The border then meets back up with the eastern bank of the Delimber River, on the other side of the high gap. The border is then completed when reaching the confluence of the Delimber River and Heartblood River. The Heartblood runs out from the eastern border of the high forest. When Amarindar stood, they called the confluence of the two rivers the Karskrag. The dwarves built two bridges that spanned the water and crossed over the western bank. The Amarindarans had a prolific mining colony to the north of the High Gap. I would not be surprised if this is where most battles were fought between the drow of Chednasad. You can see that Chednasad looks like it falls within Amarindar's borders. However, when it comes to regions and locations that take the Underdark into consideration, we need to operate in a three-dimensional space. Amarindar only existed within the mountains and down in the uppermost levels of the Underdark, known as the Upper Dark. Chednasad exists in the middle region of the Underdark, called the Middle Dark. You'd likely hear any dwarf then and now still tell you that makes no difference. The dwarves were there first, they'd have you know. Symbol of Amarindar Like other dwarven kingdoms, Amarindar had its own unique sigil. The sigil resembles the side perspective of a three-horned crown with a star above each horn's tip. The stars are all four-pointed stars. Carvings depicting this symbol may still be found in mountain trails throughout the Great Peaks and along the walls of the Underdark roads and tunnels beneath the Great Peaks themselves. However, Emerindar did not make a point to mark out their borders with such symbols like other dwarven kingdoms. History of Amarindar Amarindar was established in circa minus 4,160 DR and lasted till 882 DR, a span of over 5,000 years, 5,042 to be exact. The founders of Amarindar were some of those dwarves pushed out from the kingdom of High Shanitar. Between wars and encroachment of humans, dwarves from Shanitar and southwestern Faerun migrated to the north to found new kingdoms and territories. Amarindar is not considered to be one of the truly great dwarven kingdoms of old when you compare it to Shanitar or Delzun. 
It may have lacked the population, and it may have lacked the influence. Where Amarindar excelled was in its accumulation of wealth. The Great Peak Mountains proved to have an abundance of adamantine, which the Amarindarans forged into armor and weapons. While other dwarven realms were threatened by a continuous cycle of massive orc attacks, Amarindar continued to grow. Circa negative 3843 DR, the drow city of Chednasad was established in the northern reaches of Amarindaran territory. Going forward, Chednasad and Amarindar constantly battled one another until Amarindar fell. In negative 3373 DR, King Azkaldar of Amarindar agreed to trade with the magical empire of Netheril to the east. The Anorak Desert now marks where Netheril stood all those years ago. Amarindar had strong trade and agreements with the Netherese humans. The Netherese put the metal and ore the dwarves mined to good use. Some of the underground roads and tunnels dug by the Amarindaran dwarves still connect to the buried realms beneath Onrock, where Netheril once stood, and connect up to the still used Low Road, the defunct dwarven realm of Delzun built in the north. The Amarindarans learned about arcane magic from the Netherese. Such lessons were learned through instruction or observation. Despite the ruin of Amarindar, the lessons learned to combat and abjure arcane magic still was able to proliferate into greater dwarven society at large. Those lessons which are still being used by present-day dwarven enchanters and craft workers. In negative 2770 DR, the elven realm of Sharvin in the southern high forest fell to ruin. Monsters and other dangerous creatures rose in number due to the actions of the Favori. King Conar IV of Amarindar slew the bane of Sharvin, the red dragon, with Ero Surfell. In negative 897 DR, the deep dragon Urthurngaran kills King Olaren. Olaren was known as the greatest hero king of Amarindar. This deep dragon did lair in the Great Peak Mountains, but is currently deceased. In negative 550 DR, known as the Year of Glistening Dust, King Askeldar III established the secret arcane college of Zothul. One of the chief goals of Zothul is to develop protections against the magically gifted Netherese should they ever attack. In 1 DR, Year of Sunrise, the citadel of Yonoroth is completed. In 149 DR, Year of the Dwarf, under the renowned builder Irko Stone Shoulder, Dwarves of Amarindar complete a stone bridge that spans the Delimber River for their Erlani elf allies. This bridge now connects both halves of Loudwater. This bridge has wards that maintain its integrity. An unintended consequence of these wards manifested and still exists. River trout trying to swim under the bridge are sent flying over top the bridge. The bridge is called Flying Fish Bridge as a result. Irko Stone Shoulder also built a manor for the local elf lord, where Loudwater still stands today. In 273 DR, Year of the Delighted Dwarves, three clans of dwarves migrate from Citadel Felbar and Emerindar to the city of Mithdranor. Emerindar came to an end in 882 DR, Year of the Curse, when demons streamed out from Hellgate Keep. These demonic hordes came both across the surface and down in the Underdark. Amarindar was just one of the many casualties within the Delimber Vale at the hands of these demons. Before it was known as Hellgate Keep, the fortress was known as Askelhorn. Askelhorn was just one of many refuges for those humans who escaped the destruction and fall of Netheril. The Arlani Elves of the High Forest allowed Netherese refugees to settle where Askelhorn came to stand. As they were wont to do, these folks continued their study and practice of the arcane. Though things began to turn for the worst when a wizard named Wolgreth began to summon and bind devils to his service. Wolgreth did this so the devils might assist him in gaining an edge over other rival wizards. Wolgreth believed that he had these devils under his full control, but the devils were only partially controlled. 
As devils do, they manipulated and wove their insidious plots, influencing him and other mages throughout Asquehorn. As the years pressed on, the devils were able to convince those wizards tied to them to become liches. Now with these wizards undead, the devils slowly but surely broke what small binds might be on them to become the true masters of Asquehorn. For a few decades, the devils enacted their tyranny, but an alliance of spellcasters came together to summon forth demons, the eternal enemies of the devils. While this did drive out and kill the devils, it backfired on the summoners. The demons turned on them and killed the rest of Asquehorn. Going forward, Asquehorn came to be known as Hellgate Keep. A Baylor by the name of Grinthark took up the command in Hellgate Keep, bringing more demons out of the abyss to increase their numbers. Allying with local orcs, a sizable horde was formed. From there, this horde spread out both across and below the surface to bring both Emerindar and the elven realm of Erlon to ruin. This combined horde of orcs and demons seemed poised to attack other regions and settlements throughout the north of Faerun. Powerful wizards, Elminster and some of the Seven Sisters included, and Harpers formed an alliance. In 886 DR, they sealed the high-ranking demons within Hellgate Keep and magically forbid their ability to summon any more demons from the Abyss. While the upper-ranking demons of Hellgate Keep were magically imprisoned, they still were able to command their subordinates to leave and scout out the surrounding area. In 1221 DR, these lesser demons were able to connect tunnels between the catacombs of Hellgate Keep and abandon Amarindar. From there, the lesser demons established several outposts for their superiors in the Dwarven Maid Tunnels. The Drow of Chedna Sod and the Bullholder Hive of the Great Peaks had long been fighting throughout the Amarindaran region. Now, with the injection of demons, this only increased the number of conflicts. Over the centuries, the orcs mingled with the demons and many Tanaruka were born. A Tanaruk appears much like you would think. Hulking and muscular, with bristles, spines, horns, and or ridges coming off their body and face. Their tusks and teeth look far more dangerous than your typical orc. As the years progressed, the demonic forces of Hellgate Keep came under the leadership of a few different demonic leaders. To keep it simple, we are concerned with their last leader, the Cambian Conervok, who went by the title of the Sceptered One. Hellgate Keep came to ruin in 1369 DR, yet Kanir Vok and his Alufin consort, Elisa, and their forces escaped through the many tunnels below the high forest. Kanir pushed outwards into a handful of strategic underground location. Kanir then united five clans of the Tanaruka and brought them in to bolster his forces. His army has been called either the Scoured Legion or the Scourge Legion, depending on the source you reference. I found no info to suggest the name being changed for any historic reasons. I genuinely think it was just writers mixing up the spelling. Personally, I'm going with Scoured Legion in this episode. Kanir's seat of power was now Splendormorn, the very place the dwarven rulers of Amarindar ruled from. Amarindar today. The heirs of Amarindar lie scattered across the northwest of Faerun. Some may be aware of their status, others may be wholly unaware. One heir to the throne that is identified is Tommel Myrlhu. As of second edition sources, he is mentioned to be a priest of Dumathoan. In the Hellgate Keep Adventure module from second edition, he tasks the party with reclaiming the three crown jewels of Amarindar from within Hellgate Keep. The module does not identify that he knows of his noble status, only that he wishes to reclaim the crown jewels for Dumathoan's faith. As an aside, when I look through the module and through other sources, there's no mention of what the Amarindaran crown jewels are. You'll see when I discuss Relics of Note, none of them stand out as candidates either. Tommel is described to be in a richly appointed carriage and dress though this easily may be attributed to his status as a priest of Dumathon as much as his lineage. The module does mention that he is an aging dwarf. 
Given their long lifespans, perhaps Tommel still lives. If not, he may have children or other relatives who may now serve as heirs. A beholder hive is said to inhabit portions of the dwarven tunnels beneath the Great Peak Mountains. It only truly receives a proper description in the second edition source book Drist du Orden's Guide to the Underdark. Long ago, a spelljammer carrying a Hakatha beholder hive crashed into the Bleach Bones Pass. Just briefly touching on it, Hakatha is the eighth and furthest planet from the sun in realm space, for those of you familiar with Spelljammer. This hive then carved out their cities in the middle dark beneath the Great Peaks. Their cities fell to ruin given their conflicts with the dwarves of Amarindar, the drow of Chednasad, and the Feyrim's minions from the east beneath the Onrock. The beholders from this hive had long since scattered across the north of Faerun. Though some remnants of the hive still inhabit the tunnels and caverns beneath the Great Peaks. Perhaps the Scoured Legion has not come across them in a long time, and they remain relatively unknown. Perhaps both groups keep out of one another's territories. Perhaps they are now in open conflict with one another, but that's a call for each individual DM to make. Any adventurer attempting to reach Amarindar from the surface has a handful of different threats to contend with. You might have to face violent stone giants or the unique goblins from Decanter who wander the southern reaches of the Great Peaks. Goblins make for easy prey and nearby blue dragons are known to pick them off when they take to the air to eat. Of course, if you take the tunnels down beneath the surface, you run the risk of coming up against the Scoured Legion. Conyer unsuccessfully tried to assail Menzo Baranzin during the Silence of Lolth, then failed to assail Sundabar a year later. Conyer, Vok, and Elisa both died in 1385 DR. They are both important characters in the Empyrean Odyssey trilogy, which show the start of the Spell Plague. Both characters die in this series. Vok's Tanaruka fell to infighting when, to their knowledge, Conair disappeared without a given reason in 1373 DR. The Scoured Legion's last description is given in 4th edition sources, which portray the state of things close to the present day. 4th edition's Menzo Baranzan, City of Intrigue sourcebook, is our key source in presenting things from 1480 DR. When the Tanaruka fell to infighting, connections to Hellgate Keep were caved in and destroyed. Emerging from the civil disorder was a war chief who took control of the conflict. Over the coming years, other war chiefs would rise to lead the Legion. The last mentioned leader is High War Chief Girvox, the Legion's fourth leader after Conyer left. The Scoured Legion now operate as raiders and mercenaries. They have also found common faith in Garagos, with the emergence of a Tanaruk named Blood Reaver Jervan, who is their spiritual leader. Girvox suspects that Jervan will soon make a play to supplant him. For now, Girvox allows Jervan to hold this role. Not hurting things is Jervan's ability to conjure the souls of long dead Amarindaran warriors to fight with the Legion. The Scour Legion's manpower is listed at 7,000 strong in Splendormorn. The War Chief's goal is to unite disparate Tanaruko clans that live beneath the Nether Mountains to the north. These are a few clans Conir Vok failed to bring under his banner. From there, Girvox intends to succeed where Vok failed and take Menzo Baranzin for the Legion. Girvox envisions then assaulting the surface world next where he brings the orcs of many arrows under his power, which leads to a horde of orcs streaming out from the north to lay waste to the Sword Coast. One of the great threats to his goal is the now sentient Ormycos, who periodically ensnares a Tanaruk or two. Locations and Regions of Note The masons and builders of Amarindar built their settlements in naturally hollow sections found in the mountains, and underground. Many Amarindaran settlements and clan holds remain in remarkable shape. They are protected from erosion and wind that you would find up on the surface. Only until recently were some of them even occupied. 
rather than rectangular or square in shape, masons built their buildings to look spherical. Most are not freestanding. Often their buildings flowed into the surrounding natural stone of the cavern walls around them. Like many dwarven realms and kingdoms, much of Amarindar is not visible on the surface. Rather, it predominantly lies beneath the mountains and hills of the Grey Peaks. As dwarves are wont to do, they dug down into the upper dark. They had an extensive mining network and claimed many natural caverns. They dug out roadways that allowed a dwarf to travel from one end of Amarindar to the next without ever returning up to the surface. The many clans of Amarindar built their holds underground as well. Most clans made a point to build their clan holds near rich veins of ore and gemstones. The Shining Falls The Shining Falls are both tall and form the shape of a horseshoe. The elves of Erlon once had an outpost and a road that ran up to these waterfalls. The one entrance to the royal caverns of Amarindar lies behind the waterfalls. The durable adamantine gates still lie on the ground where they were breached by the demonic horde in 882 DR. The tombs of the Amarindaran royalty are believed to lie behind the falls. It is never confirmed that these tombs hold dead royals. What is known is these tombs lie plundered. It's pointed out in 2nd edition that the Zentarm had housed themselves in the hidden caverns. I wouldn't be surprised if the Scour Legion had kicked them out long since then. The Cavern of Cloven Heads The Cavern of Cloven Heads is a cavern found beneath the northwestern portion of the Great Peaks. It stands in what was once a part of an Amberindaran iron mining network. This site was where the last stand of Clan Black Axe occurred in negative 3,917 DR. Sources call these dwarves the Bravebeards, though I'm not sure if this is a title given to them posthumously or one they had during their lives. These dwarves stood against attacking drow who followed the infamous Menzobera, who would go on to found Menzoberanzan. Clan Black Axe held the ground in this cavern while they allowed other dwarves to safely retreat from the drow. The Black Axes were greatly outnumbered, but managed to cut down half the drow who attacked them. The last dwarf to fall was Dorn Black Axe. Racked with spasms from drow poison, Dorn shouted that the drow would, quote, meet the doom of many eyes. Dorn then fully sank into the stone beneath his feet. In time, Clan Black Axe reclaimed the Cavern of Cloven Heads, but they would lose it once more when Amarindar was abandoned. The cavern came to be occupied much later by Grimlocks. These Grimlocks are ancestors of the Red Pony and Golden Eagle Uthgart tribes. Both these tribes moved into the Underdark in 576 DR, traveling through tunnels connected to their ancestral mound called One Stone. These former humans never came back up the surface and turned into Grimlocks. Through sheer chance, these Grimlocks found the cavern of Cloven Heads in their wanderings. Within the cavern was a sizable boulder with carved dwarven runes upon its surface. All around it were cloven in drow skulls laid out in concentric circles. The runes on the boulder tell the story of the Bravebeards and their last stand. It was put on the place Dorn Black Axe sunk into the ground all those years ago. The elements of this cavern reminded the Grimlocks of the stories passed down of former ancestral mounds. As a result, the Grimlocks settled in this cavern. The Grimlocks know nothing of the truth of the cavern and its history. Dorn Black Axe and his personal effects still lay entombed in the stone beneath the boulder. An enterprising individual who is able to manipulate stone through magic could retrieve Dorne's weapons and armor. These include the Black Axe of Dorne, the Dragonbane Tower Shield, and the Adamantine Golem Cloak. The mechanical and physical descriptions of these items are not given. Thing is, the story of the Breakbeards and Dorne Black Axe continue to be told this day. It is said that any who wear or carry these items around shield dwarves run the risk of such items being identified 
and thus labeled a grave robber. So it would stand that shield dwarves have legends and myths that tell about what these items look like. Again, the source books don't cover that. The Realm of Stone and Shadow. The Realm of Stone and Shadow is a region rather than a proper location or site. It overlaps the former realm of Emerindar. The Realm of Stone and Shadow is said to be the entire lair and domain of an ancient sapphire dragon named Malerogoth, the Dragon Unseen. The Dragon Unseen rarely leaves his lair. He subsists off those creatures and drow who wander into his territory. Some of this dragon's territory includes old delving operations of the, Emer of the Emerindar and dwarves that Malayor Garoth has expanded. The dragon, unseen, has sent out several scrying mirrors throughout his realm. He uses these mirrors to survey his realm through the one floating mirror always floating near himself. The Lair of Gareth Maw. Gareth Maw is an older fang dragon who turned into a Dracolich. He goes by the alias of Incisor, which you can see spelt two different ways depending on the source book you're referencing. Gareth Maw's lair exists at the start of the Whitewater River. This river then flows into the larger river Loagran. Incisor has claimed many relics of Netherese and Amarindar in origin. He hunts over the fallen lands and Greyvale to the east of the Grey Peaks. Citadel Yonroth. Citadel Yonroth is a round redoubt built into the mountain slope overlooking Bleached Bones Pass. The dwarves of Amarindar built this citadel as a southern bastion. Their chief concern was an orcish horde that might stream down from the north. Much like the orc hordes their kinsfolk had been dealing with for centuries. Rather, it was a demonic horde that broke out from Hellgate Keep that brought Amarindar down. The legend of Princess Olma, sister to the then reigning Queen Helma, is still told. She led the defenders at Citadel Yonroth as they made a last stand to allow dwarves to flee to the south. Citadel Yonroth doubled as a hub for the network of tunnels to Amarindar and dwarves built beneath the Great Peaks. The goblins of Decanter to the east have broke through the lowest levels of Citadel Yonroth with their own tunnel. The ghosts of those dwarves who made their last stand still haunt the citadel under the orders of the ghost of Princess Olma. Other undead dwarves wail and cry out for long-gone dwarves. North Peak On the north side of the High Gap are a group of mountains the dwarves of Amarindar called North Peak. At their height, the dwarves dug out much of these mountains. It was the site of their most extensive mining operation. Significant portions of adamantine were mined here. The adamantine that would enrich the Amarindarans. Not only did they forge weapons and armor from the adamantine for themselves, but they traded it in droves with the humans of Nethril and the elves of Irlon and Ilafarn. As of writing in 3rd edition, the mining complex housed a garrison of the Scoured Legion. One of Conir Vok's lieutenants, named Trog, led the Tanaruka here. At Tanaruk himself, Trog and his group were being raided by Orogs out of Splendormorn. Trog made efforts to become allies with the Orogs, but the Orogs only continued their attacks. Given the Scour Legion rule in Splendormorn now, it is likely the Legion kicked out the Orogs. The Scour Legion likely still used North Peak as one of their key outposts. Splendormorn Splendormorn, also known as the Royal Caverns of Splendormorn, was where the throne of Amarindar sat. Splendormorn is a dwarven word that translates into common to the Shining Mountain. Shining Mountain is one of two mountains that sits to the west of the Shining Falls. As far as we know, Splendormorn is occupied by the Scoured Legion currently. The wealth of these royal caverns are likely plundered, save what remains hidden and or secured from the demonic orcs. The dwarves of Amarindar hollowed out most of the Shining Mountain, both through mundane and magical means. It is dominated by a central vault. 
which the dwarves then surrounded with a series of other roomy caverns. Many of the open levels were bridged with arcing pathways that crisscrossed over and under one another. The prominent location of Splendor Morn is the Adamantine Palace. This black palace is made from adamantine stone. Within, the walls and ceilings were engraved. These engravings were inlaid with silver, gold, and a variety of different gemstones. While a lot of these fixtures have been removed, much is untouched. Third edition sources explain that Splendor Morn was taken over by Orogs who made their way up from the Lower Dark, which is the third and lowest level of the Underdark. These Orogs pushed out what demons, Tanaruka, and Undead were found here. The leader of the Orogs, Ufsvar Skadun, intended on using Splendor Morn as a base to then attack the surface world. Before he did that, he realized he had to deal with the Scarra Legion in some capacity. Fourth edition sources describe how the Scarra Legion now reside in Splendor Morn. War Chief Girox now sits on the throne of the Adamantine Palace. Jervan and his Garagos Faithful have bound some undead dwarven spirits to fight any intruders who trespass into Splendor Morn. It does beg the question, what happened to the Orogs? Did the Scour Legion simply rout them? Did they bring the Orogs into their fold? These are all good questions, and I don't have an answer for you because the books never answer that question. Other than, you can either ignore the bit about the Orogs or fill in the blank yourself. Zothel. Zothel was a secret arcane academy established by Amarindar in the southwestern region of the Great Peaks. The vast majority of the kingdom of Amarindar was never aware of its existence. The academy was established to defend against a threat or an attack from Netheril to the east. Zothel stands out as an anomaly in dwarven culture. Dwarven arcane practitioners are such a rarity as it is in the Forgotten Realms. Over 260 years, dwarves learned the arcane arts and delved into their own variety of spellcraft. They developed their own spells and new ways to prepare spells, all in an attempt to counteract what another threat might throw at them. Speaking for myself, I suspect much of what they developed centered around the School of Abjuration the development and refinement of spells to both protect from spells and nullify them. Unfortunately, no sources spell out what the dwarves of Zalthol came up with. Probably the sources remain vague on the topic, so DMs can fill in the particulars for their own game. In the year negative 286 DR, Zalthol was ordered to close its doors. Netheril had fallen more than 150 years ago by that point. The dwarves of Amarindar saw no need to support an arcane academy without an arcane powerhouse nearby. The academy was sequestered away. The Amarindarans were to open Zothel once more should a substantial arcane threat arise again. That never came to fruition, and Zothel still remains untouched somewhere in the southwest of the Great Peak Mountains. Speaking as a DM here, perhaps should a group do enough adventuring elsewhere in the ruins of Amarindar, they might just come across a tome, a carving, whatever case it might be, a way to find and open Zothel once again. The Barrow of the Ogre King. This location is also the name of a small adventure scenario in the fourth edition campaign setting book. What is important to us is the Barrow is an underground complex built by the Amarindaran Dwarves under the South Wood. It is found beneath the forest 10 miles south of Loudwater. The Dwarves built catacombs to lay their dead here. At least as the location is presented in 4th edition, goblins lived in the abandoned space and have claimed much of the treasure laid by the interred Dwarven bodies. Their leader is also attempting to resurrect the interred Ogre King at the very bottom of the complex. A series of four web articles written during the 3rd edition era featured the elements of an ancient and far-flung dwarven cult dedicated to Baphomet. 
This series is called The Shadow Path, a portal network found in the Greater Perilous Gateways article series. I have provided a link down in the episode description to the archive introductory article, where you can then click through to the other articles in the supplemental material to go along with those articles. I'm only going to touch on those elements pertinent to Amarindar covered in the Shadow Path articles. Bear in mind the articles are presented in such a way that they could form their own small campaign. The Unspoken Hall was a secret underground shrine built by a Baphomet worshipping Amarindaran dwarves in negative 1650 DR. When the demons moved out from Hellgate Keep, they eventually found this shrine. The hall is found near Chednasad beneath the Fallen Lands. The dwarves received permission to build their shrine under the pretense that they were building another adamantine mining outpost. The dwarves also created portals allowing travel between other Baphomet cult sites found in other dwarven kingdoms and other regions of the continent. The leader of their cult was Balak Blackhan. Balak was led to the location of the Unspoken Hall through a vision. His vision spoke of a half-fiend dwarf who would claim the site and lead the cult in three centuries' time. This creature was called the Speaker. Three centuries came and went, and no fiendish dwarf arrived. Balak is still interred in the Unspoken Hall in a hidden area. His magical great axe, called Gamadurth, lies across his chest. Three thousand years progressed, and the speaker finally arrived with no cult to receive him. The speaker was born from the union between a shield dwarf from Citadel Adbar and a Vrock. He bears several vulture-like traits, large feathered wings, clawed hands and feet, and a long face with sharp features. Despite his title, the speaker has never uttered a word. The speaker is unsure of what effect his words would have, so he has never spoken. Make no mistake, he is still quite evil, and to take what little reverence he receives from the few demons that may still lurk in nearby tunnels. The speaker is forced to scrounge and survive in a site that was built to house him in luxury and praise. The Unspoken Hall has a powerful forge called the Hellfire Forge. Not the best name for the forge considering the constant flames heating the forge come from a portal tied to the abyss, but that's just my own commentary. The portal will take an individual to an unnamed region of the abyss where fire-loving demons live. The essences within the flames allowed the ancient Amarindaran cult to forge several unholy weapons. The unspoken hall contains two important portals that link the hall to two other Baphomet cult sites. First portal takes someone to the labyrinth, which I will touch on in a moment. The second portal takes someone to Ilkazar, the last of the surviving dwarf kingdoms of Shanatar. In Ilkazar, there is no cult in existence, save for a dwarven rogue who learned of the long since past ancient dwarven cult. In the third edition era, this dwarf traveled the entire shadow path likely the only one to do this for millennia. It may be possible that she has since established her own cult beneath the noses of Ilkazar. At the time the articles were written, she was beginning to establish connections between the various cult sites connected by the Shadow Path as it is. Since we are going to talk about the Labyrinth now, we may as well turn our focus away from Amarindar proper and turn our attention to other locations where they left their footprint. The Labyrinth is an underdark region found in northwestern Faerun. In circa negative 2200 DR, dwarves from Amarindar built this twisting network of tunnels and passages. These Amarindarans were devotees of the demon lord Bavmet. Several minotaurs and other bullheaded creatures came to populate this region as a result. Later, evil creatures known as Bavatars came to live in the Labyrinth. The Bafatars were created through the fusing of human, minotaur, and demon blood by Netherese wizards. A portal from the Unspoken Hall takes a person into the heart of the labyrinth. A relatively close-by portal 
leads to Orendal, where yet another Baphomet cult holds residence, though this one is a secretive Illithid cult, of all things. Following the appropriate tunnels in the labyrinth, a devotee can find the pit of Howling Grief. Here, the Amarindaran dwarves placed a black rock slab. This slab served as an altar for them and still serves the same purpose for the Bavatars. The black slab seems to absorb any light source near it. The slab also sits beside a seemingly bottomless chasm. Issuing out of the chasm are moans and wails from some unknown source, all born out of the chasm on a continuous scalding breeze. The dwarves of Amarindar are mined beneath the high forest for their allies, the elves of Erlon. Texts recovered from Amarindar speak to a massive fungus of epic proportions that expanded into those mines and hindered and stopped mining operations altogether. This massive fungus is known as Oromycos, long believed to be the largest organism in all of Faerun. The name Oromycos is a dwarven name that translates to Great Fungus. Even still, elven legends dating back to the Crown Wars speak to Oromycos' creation. These legends say the Vaishanatar mages during the Crown Wars created Oromycos. The truth is clouded in myth and legend. Any truth about Oromycos is obscured and hidden from divination. If the gods know Oromycos' true origins and its true purpose, they remain silent. What is even more concerning is that Oromycos has woken up following the spell plague. On Thrillian Thor, in the star mounts of the High Forest, the Amarindarans completed a major project for their Irlani allies that the elves called On Thrillianthor. Within the mountains are dwarven carved tunnels, spiral stairways, and shafts that form a major underground complex that runs on for miles. Many of these shafts run up to the peak of the southernmost mountain in the range. Openings on the peak of the mountain and stables within hint that the elves house their aerial mounts here. Strong winds whip in and through the openings of Anthrianthor. The winds are difficult to walk against and speak over. Layering with Anthrianthor is a deep dragon named Onskarard. He once layered near Chednasad until the tumult and chaos following its destruction convinced the dragon to live elsewhere. I wonder if Onskarard learned about Anthrianthor from some piece of lore he had in his hoard tied to Amarindar. The Dark Lake Beneath the Evermores is the Dark Lake. The Dark Lake was once larger and spread out to numerous caverns. That was until Amarindaran dwarves built locks and dams to change the water level. The dwarves created dry pathways to travel throughout this part of the Underdark. These locks and dams are still functional, a credit to their engineering. The Endless Caverns To the south of the Star Mounts are a series of limestone caverns dug out by the dwarves of Amarindar. Just yet another mining project undertaken for their Erlani allies. Part of the Endless Caverns is occupied by a lich of great power from ancient Nethril. His name is Omvor, and he has had a lair sequestered in this part of the world before even Netheril fell in negative 339dr. Omvor's contingency spell teleported him here to safety when Karstas' hubris brought low the flying cities. The Tree of Wailing Souls The Tree of Wailing Souls is deeply evil, and it is an ancient tree that stands atop one of the westernmost hills in the eastern portion of the Nether Mountains, south, south of the Turnstone Pass. I won't go into great detail about the tree. It is quite the interesting creature if evil trees manifesting the heads of those souls bound to it are your bag. I will include a link to the web article it is featured in down in the episode description. What is important to us is that the soul of King Connar V of Amarindar is still bound to the tree. Connar V was one of Amarindar's last monarchs. Relics of Note 
The demonic invasion of their realm caught Amarindar by surprise. As a result, much of their wealth and treasure was not hidden away properly or was left out for the taking. A large amount of this treasure was brought back to Hellgate Keep, if not claimed by Drow of Chedna Sod or the Great Peak Mountain Hive of Beholders. Other treasure seekers and adventurers have uncovered relics of Amarindar over the years. Such tales and treasures are usually heard in nearby Loudwater. The armorsmiths of Amarindar are renowned for their ever-bright adamantine armor. As the term suggests, Everbright is an enchantment placed upon armor to keep it both bright and free from rust. These suits of full plate often featured horns, spikes, and emblems. Typically, this armor had a silver-blue hue to it. The undead creatures who were part of the Scour Legion were observed wearing such suits of armor when patrolling near the Shining Falls. Still, much of the adamantine pieces are unaccounted for, and likely still lie in the caverns, caches, and holds of Amarindar, if the Scour Legion have not got to the rest already. Another type of magical armor made by the Amarindar armorsmiths was silver roaring breastplate armor. Twelve sets of this armor were made to protect the honor guard of the Amarindaran royalty. All twelve sets are thought to be in the possession of the Tanaruka of the Scoured Legion. The Roaring Armor is found in both 2nd edition's Hellgate Keep and 3rd edition's Races of Faerun. The armor grants the wearer plus 2 to AC in both editions. In 2nd edition, the armor also reflects all casted direct spells, arrows, and other missiles back at the attacker. 3rd edition downgraded this ability, only limiting it to non-magical missiles that do 10 points of damage or less. In 2nd edition, the armor prevents creatures gaining any bonus attacking from behind the wearer. While in 3rd edition, the armor gives the wearer access to the uncanny dodge ability familiar to rogues. This is where the roaring quality comes in. Whether it's the dragons or bears engraved on the armor, both roar to warn the wearer they are being attacked from behind. There exist a few named relics tied to people of note from Amarindar as well. The Harpers have listed these named relics alongside those taken from Irland by the demons of Hellgate Keep. They have been statted out across 2nd edition and 3rd edition. All mention of the following relics are found in 2nd edition's Hellgate Keep. The same items can be found in 3rd edition sources, those spread out across a few different books. Aoaxer's Helm, mentioned in 3rd edition's Lost Empires. Aoaxer was one of several Amarindaran heroes. The helm gifted him with the ability to pick out which of his allies were on death's door. He was known for passing on the parting wishes and final last words of those who died fighting alongside him. This magical helm is open-faced, sturdy, but otherwise looks mundane. In 2nd edition, it possesses a unique divinatory property. First, you place it atop the head of a dead humanoid for three days, after which a living humanoid who then puts on the helm perceives the final moments of the dead humanoid's life through that dead individual's own perspective. In 3rd edition, the helm allows the wearer to cast Death Watch at will and speak with dead once per day. Captain Arad's shield mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun, is another relic attributed to a dwarven hero. The legends around the shield say weapons shattered when striking it. In actuality, the shield has a sizable bonus to armor class, plus 3 in both editions. The stories aren't false, just they speak to mundane bronze weapons, easily breaking across such a strong shield. Crayon Mole's Hammer, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun, Kran Mol was quite the greedy dwarf, but a skilled warrior. His warhammer has the innate ability to sense gold. Not that it is said how this property manifests. Perhaps the warhammer has a simple degree of sentience or vibrates slightly when near a large collection of gold. This warhammer sheds bright light like a torch. It gives a sizable plus 3 bonus to attacks and damage in both editions. 
Secondly, it rings out with the sound of a temple bell when drow are near. Third edition clarifies this ability, stating the sound rings out whenever a drow is within 60 feet of the hammer. If the wielder takes one round to concentrate, they can sense where the closest drow is to them, and just how many drow are within 60 feet of them. Next is the Dragon's Heart Armor of King Connard IV, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun. Both descriptions of the armor in 2nd edition and 3rd edition do not mention which dragon it was sourced from. Context clues, though, point immediately towards the slain red worm, Rithairosufel, who King Connar slew, as mentioned earlier in the episode. King Connar IV was one of Amarindar's last monarchs. This armor is dragon scale mail, made from the scales of a red dragon. The suit's helmet was formed into the shape of a dragon's head. It inherently comes with a plus one magical bonus to armor class in 2nd edition. 2nd edition also describes how the armor grants bonuses to saves against fire-based attacks and breath weapons, along with reductions to fire damage. 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun presents it with the same plus one bonus to armor class, though with a flat resistance 10 to fire. The Glove of Tarnum the Vigilant, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun, is a magical chainmail gauntlet. There is no mention as to who Tarnum the Vigilant was. The wearer can imbue the throne and returning properties of a dwarven thrower onto any held melee weapon. Just the gauntlet does not grant any additional bonuses to hit or damage. The Lashing Sword of Samos the Skull Reaver, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun, is a unique magical weapon with a unique impotent ability. Samos was a renowned dwarven hunter of the undead. When this short sword is swung, an arc of magical energy trails behind it. The sword is so destructive to the undead that if the sword merely touches the undead creature, they are destroyed outright. Third edition gives the lashing sword a plus one bonus. Blue energy arcs out from the pommel, much like a whip. When you hit an undead creature with the weapon, an undead needs to make a save or be destroyed outright. The weapon is harmless to all other types of creatures. The Pegasus Helm of Cloth Iron Star, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun, was worn by, quote, the legendary scout Cloth Iron Star. This beautiful winged helm grants a magical plus one bonus to armor class in 2nd edition. As the name hints at, it can summon a translucent Pegasus mount twice per day. The Pegasus is strong enough to carry two human-sized creatures. The Pegasus lacks any true intelligence and does not think for itself. Rather, it may take instructions telepathically from the person who wears the helm. Third edition removes the bonus to armor class. It spells out that the summoned Pegasus lasts only for three hours. I've run into the Iron Star clan name across a few different sources. I feel like I have to do an episode on them down the line. Twin Blades Alight is a magical battle axe, mentioned in 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun. Unlike previous items, its identity is not tied to the namesake of someone from Amarindar. The two heads of this battle axe are made from separate materials. One half is made of black iron, the other is made from mithril. If a dwarf of lawful good alignment touches the weapon, the axe glows. Not only that, it gains the properties of a vorpal weapon. Should anyone else wield this battle axe, it acts only as a plus two battle axe. Third edition describes this plus two battle axe differently. The other axe head is made from cold iron and not mithril. In the hands of a lawful good dwarf, it gives off a dull glow and gains the axiomatic and holy properties. Tyranny's Nell is a magical warhammer mentioned in third edition's Player's Guide to Faerun. It is a potent gold warhammer. To start, it is a plus three warhammer with the throne and returning properties of a dwarven thrower. Next is its ability to shrink a giant by one foot every time it lands true. It is unknown whether this is a permanent or temporary reduction. Likely its strongest ability is causing earthquakes by striking the ground. The stories around Tyranny's Nell do not record if this is only possible once per day. But the fact that the stories that mention it 
as it is used in battle, only tell of the earthquake effect occurring once, hint towards it being a one-time use. Third edition provides specifics limiting the earthquake effect to once a day. Giants struck by the hammer must make a save or suffer the effects of the reduced spell. An interesting Amarindaran relic found in the small 4th edition scenario, Barrow of the Ogre King I touched on earlier, is a stepping disc. A stepping disc is described to look like a large stone plug, like one for your bathtub or sink. Across the disc's surface are all sorts of dwarven runes that form nonsensical words. A stepping stone is 100 pounds and appears to be portable and not embedded in the ground. The idea was for a dwarf to step on these stones. The stones then transported them across their realm instantly. How to operate these stepping discs has been lost to time. I think the idea is that the dwarves of Amarindar made portable stepping discs that were moved around their realm, though the book doesn't say that outright. I have to wonder if the stepping discs were developed by the mages of Zothal. The adventure spells out that anyone who simply just steps onto a disc is whisked away to a silvery void until a save is made in future rounds, or someone moves the stepping disc itself from its current position. This seems just like another blank space for a DM to fill in with their own imagination. Gamma Dearth is the great axe interred with Balak Black Hand, leader of the unspoken hall Baphomet cult. Described with 3rd edition mechanics, this weapon is a plus 3 adamantine great axe with the unholy trait. This weapon is sentient with a, with a chaotic evil alignment. It is capable of speech, speaking common, dwarven, abyssal, and giant, and then has telepathic capabilities on top of that. It allows the wielder to cast Detect Good at will and cast Finger of Death once per day. Finally, the Great Axe grants the wielder the abilities of the Sunder and Blind Fight feats. For this final group of relics, I have to say something up front. The author of the web article I got this information from is demonstrating how magic items sourced from a setting agnostic source book might fit these items into an established setting. So these aren't magic items found in a Forgotten Realms book proper. That said, I do like the angle taken by the author, but again, I stress that this is not canonical. Augment crystals are enchanted crystals or gems that can be attached to armor or weapons to grant those items a specific effect. An augment crystal is transferable between different items and not permanently affixed or embedded into the first object it is placed on. Augment crystals are described in greater detail in the third edition book, Magic Item Compendium. To get back to how the author of the article ties this back to Amarindar. Augment crystals were developed by Zothel, Amarindar's secret arcane academy. These crystals were portable and transferable among Amarindar's forces. Should Netheril ever have attacked the kingdom? I imagine most of the augment crystals developed primarily nullified magics or provided the carrier with greater defenses against arcane spells. That said, the vast majority of what was made remains in the hidden and abandoned school of Zothel. However, secretly one of the dwarven Arcanists stole away with a few augment crystals. These crystals have begun to surface across Faerun. If you have ever listened to my content, you may be wondering why I have made an episode outside my usual purview. If you are newer, you may be confused why a guy called Religion in the Realms is talking about Dwarven history. For past audience members, I will get back to covering pantheons and gods. For those who are new, if you're interested in the gods of the Forgotten Realms at all, I encourage you to look into my back catalog. I needed a break from covering all things divine. I do love dwarves. I genuinely think older realms and kingdoms from the Forgotten Realms need far more coverage than just another episode on Netheril. Netheril's great, just I don't think people need another person to talk to them about Mithlars and Karsus. So I figured why not cover one of the fallen dwarven kingdoms. I went with Amarindar first because ever since I read about it, it has always stuck with me. Can you expect episodes on other kingdoms? Probably. I see this more as a palate cleanser more than anything else, but I can see myself returning to make other dwarven legacy episodes. 
They don't necessarily always have to do with defunct kingdoms either. Say, how about an episode on the Arctic Dwarves of the Forgotten Realms? If you have made it this far, I appreciate you listening to this episode. Links are found in the episode description to where you can stream, download, or listen to my content. Until next time, rock and stone, hammer and axe, never break, never yield.